topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Diversity Talk. I'm Wendy Stewart, and I am so happy to be here with all of you tonight. It's Wendy on Wednesday, as I like to say. I just have to share uh, something with all of you. Last night, I went to um, an amazing uh, reading and presentation about drag in the LGBTQ Center on 13th Street in the city. And uh, the person who was speaking is Alyssa Goodman. She actually, I have to tell you, I've read lots of books on drag. This is the most comprehensive historical book on drag. It's called Glitter and Concrete. Uh, it was done by Alyssa Goodman. And uh, what really uh, impressed me about her, maybe she's like 33, 34 years old. And originally the book was 600 pages. She got it down to 400 pages. I could, I don't know how she knew of all the people like that I came up with, or that a lot of you came up with, the clubs, the people. And, um, you know, it, it was actually the stories, it's a very academic book. And uh, for people that really want to know more about drag, I have to give a shout out. You have to get it, Glitter and Concrete, and you'll, of course, recognize tons of the personalities in there. So you can probably tell I'm on a roll with authors. And uh, one of the coolest things about Triversity, we've added in some new things. We now have a game night, but we also have a book club, right? And uh, I don't have a lot of time to read, although I do have to read because I have two podcasts and I have authors on my shows. But uh, this particular author that's going to be here tonight. I heard that he was going to be uh, affiliated with the book club, that they were reading his book. And when I heard what it was about, I was like chomping at the bit. I, I said to myself, oh my God, I absolutely have to have him on Triversity Talk. So our tonight is going to be Patrick Field. The book we're going to be talking about is Servant but he's written more than a few books, okay? This is his latest book, and it was inspired by true supernatural events that happened to the author and his husband in this historical house that they bought. And in some way, the Lenape Indians are woven into this story. I mean, it is a novel, right? But it's based on true events. And uh, you know what? The, the amount of storytelling in this is just so incredible. And the impact that a story like this has going back in history on modern day novels. You know what? I'm just going to let my guests take it away. Please welcome Patrick Field. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Lynn Wendy. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, it's so great to have you here. Now, are you in your historic home right now? I am, and I'm actually in the I'm actually in the room that has the most activity. In so the I asked you that. I've never asked a guest that. Okay, I had a reason for asking you that because I can feel that particular room. You know, I'm Scotch mm -hmm. Irish. My grandmother supported herself by reading tea leaves when she came to this country, and my mother would know when someone passed away. She'd have premonitions, right? So mm -hmm. when I heard that. Uh, First of all, you have a background in neuroscience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually have a degree. I have a PhD in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. PhD in neuroscience. And yet you, you're applying this to the paranormal. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So nobody, nobody's doing this, okay? You're, mm -hmm. you're one of a kind. So um, how, how did all this come about for you? 
So this particular book in, in particular, this is a culmination of sightings, of, of actual audio. We've heard, we've heard the spirit before, uh, and we call it spirit because I have, I have friends who are mediums, and that's what they refer to it as, as spirit, not the spirit, but as spirit. Now, did uh, your friends who are mediums, so I've worked with um, e EVC, the electronic, the electronic voice recordings, did mm -hmm. you? that in your no home. no we haven't and actually there's been quite a few people that have like you know volunteered to actually try and drive out our spirit we're like absolutely not that's what makes it so interesting here you know <laughs> well i gotta tell you something i think in um the vibe i'm getting your spirit is protecting the both of you who live mm -hmm. there yeah, um no absolutely. matter what before you have that protection you don't want to drive that spirit out no, no. And, 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 and that's, uh, it, it's, that's very important. And, and when I talk to the mediums, they're like, me, you know, ghosts get a very bad rap. They're, you know, the, the people think that they're evil. They are not evil. They are, they're just like they were when they won the earth. Our particular spirit is very mischievous, likes to play tricks with us all the time. It's just, yeah. and I will tell you, I could, when I do write the sequel, to Servant, and I will be writing a sequel to it at some point. Uh, it's going to be more from one of the characters named Gladys. She's the medium in Servant. You, you like her. You have a fondness for Gladys. I, I, I love I love her. She's my Your favorite, favorite character. character. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, she, I will be utilizing the things that have happened since I wrote Servant in terms of the things that have happened in this house and especially in this room that I'm in right now and that will build on to the sightings and the odd the, the 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 physical sightings as well as the audio as well as you know the things that this the spirit likes to play with loves to hide things from us all the time like what kind yeah I was going to ask you you said the spirit loves to play tricks mm -hmm. what kind of tricks so the latest was, you'll love this. I'm going to try and condense as much as I can. So we were going to an event here in our community and I was putting together, it was a BYOB. I put together this, uh, you know, this, this uh, bag with all of our beers and I specifically put the can opener in there. Now it's not a very fancy one. It's just a, a plain metal, like, you know, church key, put it in there, knowing that I put it in there. And when we got to the event, sure enough, it's gone. I don't know where it is. So, so the thing is, when, when things happen in this house, we have to first, like, okay, first, as the neuroscientist, as the scientist, I have to do the logical, right? It's like, okay, okay so what happened? Well, obviously, the the can opener fell out somehow, or the bottle opener fell out somewhere. Right. Okay, so it could, you know, on the on the travel there, well, you know, it wasn't there when we were there. I checked in the car, I checked around the car. No, it's gone. And again, it's not expensive. It's not something that it was like you know an heirloom of any sort. So we're like, I didn't think about it. So we get back and I, I go back to where the actual bag was. I looked again. I looked oh, around the uh, kitchen island, looked on the floor, just because, you know, something we use on our boat. So I was like, ah, you know, three days later, I come home and there it is sitting on top of the, the, the island. Wow. And I say to my husband, say, oh, you found the can opener or you found the bottle opener. And he's like, no, uh-huh, guess where I found it. And I was like, okay, where did you find it? Upstairs in our bedroom underneath the dresser. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And the only way it could have gotten up there is it was put up there. I tried to, th Wendy, I tried to think of everything. Okay. Well, then maybe here's, here's, here's how crazy it would have to been. The, somehow the bottle opener slides out of the bag into my pocket. Then I go upstairs and then as I'm taking my pants off or whatever, or whatever it was I was wearing, oh, then God. it bounced down and it was on the floor. But the problem with that is how does it get underneath of the dresser? Well, I'm not buying any of that logic. You know, if that, I'm not buying it from logic. like when it slid into your pocket. I mean, you know, but yeah. how, that's so yeah. incredible. Yeah. Okay. Well, what is the age of your house? So the house is not that old. That's what makes it so interesting. It, it, it's only about 40 or 50 years old. But it's on and old land. It's on it not is. property. It is. We live on a glacial lake. And so when this all started happening, I did my research to make sure there had been nobody that died in this house. Nobody died in this house. Yeah, right. I always do that. Right. Yeah. It could be, I had to find out what this, you know, where could this spirit be? So then I started like doing some research or talking. I said, well, the Lenape uh, were very prevalent in this area. And this is a glacial lake. This is not a man-made lake. So this lake has been around for hundreds of thousands of years, if not a million. 
So obviously this would be, to me, that was like, well, that's the answer. It's got to be something. There's got to be a burial ground around here. There's got to be some sort of connection because it's really interesting. This spirit also is not, it is not, doesn't understand modern sort of like, you know, technology. It plays with things that it doesn't understand. And I think it's like trying to learn something. For example, in this room that we have right now, over here on the wall, we have a dial on the wall that controls the heat in this room. And one day, I'm not kidding, in the middle of September, we, I came in here and it was full blast. The heat was on wow. in here. And I was like, I, I asked my husband right away, I said, uh, did, why did you turn the heat on in the room? It was, it's like, it's like 80 degrees outside or 70 degrees. Whatever. He's like, I didn't turn it on. And I was like, so yeah, uh, just things like that, you know, but he, but also I he, think the spirit is, um, even though it doesn't understand technology is using ways to like reach out to you and say, Hey, it's me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here, which is kind of cool because you have, I love that you have respect first of all, for this entity that mm. you're sh you're sharing your home with. Yeah, and and the thing is, and you know, you, ref you see, I'm referring to him as he, because right. uh, my husband and my Matt and myself have both seen the 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 shadow, and that was a really interesting conversation one morning at breakfast. I was like, so I want to tell you about something that I saw in the bathroom, and I was like, uh, what? And then when he said, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, I've to. It's very tall. Uh, and, and broad shoulders. I mean, it's 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 very much a masculine sort of shadow masculine that we've seen. Masculine silhouette. Ultimate. And actually, Matt heard uh heard him talk to him one day when he was walking up the stairs. He just walked up the stairs one day, and out of nowhere, the spirit said hello, and it was a male voice. So it was like, wow. so it, it, it's very much so we 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 refer to him as Henry. <laughs> so <laughs> so whenever we have anything happen, it's always like. Uh, so let me tell you what Henry did today. Uh, the late, though, another one was we were both in the kitchen and I was drying dishes. Matt was uh, at the closet underneath of the stairwell, and I'm and he turned. I look around. I look at him, and he's got this expression on his face. And I said, "What's what's up?" And he's like, um, "Did you just tap me on the shoulder?" And I was like, "No, I'm over here drying dishes." And he's like, "Wow, Henry." You know, and, and and again, it's you never know when he's going to make his presence. But but getting back to the whole thing with the Lenape, it was like I didn't know where else it could be. I, there, there's nobody that died here, but there is a clearly a spirit here, and so that is what and and that was the germ that I used to be able to bring the Lenape so into the novel. For the, for the novel. I'm also wondering though, before your house, all right, because mm -hmm. it's not super old. Were right. you able to get like historical documents to see what was exactly where your house was? Well, I know that this actually there was uh, before this. There's 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 nothing here. There was nothing here. There's nothing ever been built here um, in terms of our modern architecture. Um, the the neighborhood that I live in, there's a few homes that were here privately before the 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 the, uh, the uh, community was established. But in terms of research, um, I have not done research, but I have found. I have found artifacts here on the property. I have you found have. something that looked something along the lines of it wasn't an arrowhead, but it was something like it looked like the like yeah. like something like on an axe. Yeah, like and a tool, axe, right? Yeah, like a tool of some sort. And I found that down by where you expect it to be, down by the lake edge. And so it's kind of like it just was like. My other, <laughs> my other choice, and I, I, this was not the choice that I was hoping, and I was like, no, I don't want to hear about this, is that, you know, a lot of times people will tell us that the lakes out here in Pennsylvania were the common dumping grounds for, you know, the mob and it kills yeah. the bodies out here. Well, that's not where I didn't want to go with a, you know, a spirit of a, you know, some kind of a, you know, assassinated gangster. That was not where that's I wanted to go. Novel, with. Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> a totally totally different novel. Right. And I don't think that that spirit would be quite as, uh, it wouldn't be doing the same thing. Again, this, this, the uh, Henry is very obsessed with like modern things. He, he, he oh, and we had another thing. We had a candle. You'll love this. We got a pillar candle. Uh, it was, it's a fake pillar candle. It's an electric pillar candle, very large. We could not get it to work. And then finally one day, for whatever reason, turned it on. Great. Well, when that night when we were ready to go out and we left in the porch and we were ready to go in, try to turn it off. Would not turn off. Okay, turn so off. we tried everything. That candle burned night and day, 24-7 for three wow. months straight. 
You couldn't get it off no matter what you did. No, but. and there's no way a battery would ever last that long. I mean, it was all, and we would actually, every night we would go and check out on the porch. Oh yeah, it's still on. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is just really so incredible. Some of the things that you're bringing up here. I'm curious. Um, we have a great internet connection. You're well lit. I haven't seen a flicker or anything. Has Henry <laughs> tried to interfere uh, when you're online or anything like that? Because often the um, there's a place I broadcast another show out of that's mm -hmm. really haunted. It's in the city. It's Pangea. And there's all kinds of some days weird electrical stuff happens yeah yeah well so, i'll tell you what he did tonight or or, or i'm i don't know if this is true or not so you said to get on here at 6 50 i right. walked in here i've been here for a while and my phone is right next to me and it just lit up at 6 50 for no reason like it, i didn't touch it it just right. lit up and said 6 50 was almost like was thank saying, you henry <laughs> exactly it's like henry, henry, henry said this. you need to be here at 6 50 this is when this gets started right <laughs> wow. This is, this is also incredible to me, Patrick, because um, first of all, the trajectory of your career, you are a PhD in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But, but yeah. yet this parallel with the paranormal exists. Mm -hmm. Has this always been a part of you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've I, Since I was a kid, I've been fascinated, just fascinated with the paranormal. Yeah. Same. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I I grew up on Scooby Doo, and I grew up, you know, with the Adams Family and the Munsters, and all of that, all all of that sort of like the genre. Bewitched, I love that. You know, Bewitched is very much the germ also for the novel that's coming out that I have coming out this uh, summer called The Bedfordshire Warlock. So I right. in that one, it's like actually a, a, a reviewer that uh, that did a review for me said uh, based on he got to read it, and he says you would think that I was a warlock at one time in my in my existence somewhere in one of my past so lives you know, I right. too much about it <laughs> I, have, I have to think like um the family you grew up in was anyone else oriented towards this i don't think so i i, I mean we, it was a very we were a conservative family but it wasn't like you know like like overly conservative in any way shape or right. form but um no you know they were always sort of just like you know they, they were always like well, Patrick, you know, like my grandmother asked me one time, she said, she said, well, what's your favorite holiday? Like she asked me that one time and she was thinking, oh, I was going to say Easter or Christmas or Halloween. You know, some, Halloween. Halloween. <laughs> or the Day of the Dead. <laughs> or Day of the Dead. And I, what I learned out about that, actually, when I learned about Day of the Dead, when we lived, we actually lived in Manhattan for 12 years. When I learned about Day of the Dead, I was like, okay, we have to go. We have to go. And we went over to the the the, the Barrio Museum because they oh, have yeah. Like, oh, yeah, the that's a great museum. There. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. I mean, anything involving sort of the afterlife has always been so fascinating to me. You know, Absolutely. without getting without getting too much into the sort of the devil worship and no, all the, the devil yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's that that right. creeps me out. Yeah, the whole it's thing. It's ironic because before you came on tonight, um, I had a, a hospice nurse who's got an, another book coming out because she helped, she is there when people transition, right? Yeah. And we got into this conversation because I went on my phone and my, my husband, I recently lost him and she had kind of been uh, a shoulder for me to cry on while I was going through all of this. I looked on my phone and I see that she had left a message for me on March 19th and I hadn't spoken to her in weeks. So I called her tonight. I said, why did you call me on March 19th, Marie? And she said, well, that's when it happened, right? There's no way she could have known this. I said, that's when Alan passed. Yeah, it was March oh, 19th. Wow. But, I'm so sorry but, for your loss, by the but, way. Well, thank you. Um, but, you know, um, I'm a big believer in the afterlife. And I don't care who's listening who thinks that you and I should, <laughs> are survival. <laughs> because I have seen, I've spent a lot of time in Africa and I, I, I know that these things exist. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I love that you're, as a scientist, I love that you're embracing it because I meet very few scientists, especially with being a member of the Explorers Club, that can even wrap their heads around this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting you bring the neuroscience part up because there's actually a huge part of our brain that we don't understand what it does. 
Right. We don't right. understand what it does. Like there, there's lots of places we you can ma you know, map the brain and find like, oh, wow, this is the area for motor control. And this is the area for speech. And this is the area for sensory control. And and also in terms of the higher functions, like in terms of where memory is or where. Right. But there are areas of the brain that we have no idea what they do. And, and how can we, yeah. you know, deny in in this afterlife? You know, my husband, the last week and a half was seeing uh people that he used to know that had crossed over yeah all right and it it was absolutely incredible to me and i think we need as a society right to pay more attention mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. things like this and i guess you know you're like the sacrificial lamb you're the scientist that's saying i know when the minute i heard about you i'm like oh my god he has to be on the show because you're you're the one you have all the credibility from science Mike, yeah. you were uh for what 21 years i you know i taught for 26 years 26 mm -hmm. years so you've yeah. got that you are credibility sitting right in front of me and yet you've cho chosen to not only acknowledge this path you're writing about it in a novel but you're actually writing about it from a basis of fact and there's yeah. not a lot of people doing that patrick so you are you are your own breed yeah absolutely and it's funny because i think when uh People that start reading my books when the next one comes out, and I just actually sent my uh, the third one to my editor, and she's looking at that right now. So I, I mean, I, I'm kind of rolling all this stuff out, but a lot of like you're saying, like the my neuroscience and my anatomical background definitely makes its foray into everything. All of my human characters in all of my books absolutely are bound by the natural laws they it never ever it never ever goes outside of those parameters ever well, that's the scientist yeah and that's the scientist in me i can't you know when you have a human interaction with the i'm not gonna i'm not gonna have anything like supernatural unless the person possesses supernatural powers then that's where my world comes in that's when i get to create the world that i want to for those characters right. and so but if you have two human characters like for example like gladys and Mitch or and Buck and Servant, when they're interacting with each other, it is absolutely bound by natural law. There's nothing that is going on. There's no such thing as alternative facts, if you know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> so no, like, totally. Yeah. And it's so interesting that Patrick, who was this um this kid who loved the supernatural, but went on to become a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah has never left this part of him behind and has incorporated it as as a writer exactly. and then you, have, you incorporate an lgbtq character in the book oh absolutely i mean it's very important for me we go back to what we just talked about a minute ago like what scooby-doo and all that as a gay man growing up there were no role models for me like in terms of this you know i would put myself like into some of these cartoons or some of these movies or i, I used to love to watch christopher lee and dracula i put myself i would put myself like okay so this is where what if this was a same sex attraction kind of thing you know what i mean or whatever and, and i would and that and so it's very important for me that all of my characters all of my protagonists in every single book that I've written are LGBTQ. I mean, I or they're questioning. They're right. questioning. Um, right. but, um, so what what my copy editor told me one time, she says, you have established a, a niche that nobody else has ever done this before. No, I'm, I'm telling you because, right, I, I was at a big, L, I was at the LGBTQ Center on 13th Street last night for this reading. Mm -hmm. And the room was surrounded in LGBTQ books authors some of them i've had on here there there was not one book there that dealt with this genre you're yeah. like you're going into a whole brave new world here which is so fabulous really well thank you and I, and I, yeah and i think it's important because i think it's um you know when i'm writing when i'm writing from my perspective when i'm writing from the queer perspective on things it's like okay right. i'm taking some of the you know i wouldn't say the tropes but, but they are kind of like in terms of the way that we have learned literature that is part of this genre. I'm taking those tropes and I'm putting it from the queer perspective in the sense like, well, this is the way that a gay man would see this. This is how a gay man would interact with this when he was confronted with the supernatural. And for example, like in Servant, uh, it turns out, you know, when 
uh, Mitch and Buck, the married couple that encountered this spirit, Jedediah, they're like trying to understand what's going on with him. Why can't he cross over into the afterlife? And as they delve deeper into who he was and what his life was, it becomes very apparent to them. There's a reason why he is connecting with them specifically. Right why right. Jedediah is connecting with Mitch and Buck specifically. And he's never connected with anybody since his, and again, he's disappeared. So you don't know what's happened. You presume that he's dead. Well, obviously when his spirit shows up that he is. Yeah, you know, that's a dead giveaway. Oh, pardon the pun. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't given anything away because it's like right in the blurb of the back of the book. It just- No, I know. Crazy. And uh, yes. I love, uh, you know, your whole synopsis and everything that you sent. Usually I have enough time where I can at least skim through someone's book. I didn't even get mm -hmm. the chance to do that on this, but um, what you sent was so concise it, from the get-go. It's like you had, you pulled me in. I can't, I can't wait to read your book. Well, I will so, tell you, most people say that it is a quick read because they can't put it down. And I was yeah, like, sure, that right. as the author is one of the, the, the most, like, that's the biggest compliment you can give me. It's like, I literally have people from my church that said, they they said, we could not, I could not put the book down. My husband was telling me, you need to come to bed now, or you need to do this. And I couldn't stop well, reading it. So, yeah. Well, I also, I, you know, there were some nice quotes I took from uh, Amazon, which of course I can't find now that I'm looking for them, but um, uh I usually read history or hard sci-fi, but I wasn't so sure about a ghost story. The plot flows easily and remains interesting. The characters presented well are interesting and believable. This book was a welcome, easy read. Or the author's ability to use highly descriptive details to bring the reader into each scenario as if physically present. At times you can almost smell the food cooking as well as the fall leaves. The characters are true to life. Uh, and uh, that's person wrote captivating page turner. I mean, yeah. come on, that's, that's enough for me. You know? <laughs> Someone told me they said that it was the perfect read for a long, uh, long plane ride. They said yeah, you could yeah. read this in a long plane ride if you wanted to, which again, that to me is like, as a reader myself, I when I want to when I'm reading something, I want to be able to like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? You know, and another part of this also for me because we're being you know raised on television, being a latchkey child, uh, my mother was someone who had a career way before women at her time were ever supposed to have a career. What so did she do? What did your mother do? My mother was a physicist. <laughs> God, I can't take it. I could like barely make it through medical course. I had to become an anthropology major. Yes, he was a physicist. Have, like that. brains by osmosis. <laughs> but she, she, was, wow. she was a physicist for the Department of Navy. Uh, but uh, but it was interesting because being at home and and and, and seeing all these things, it, it was yeah, it was like it was one of these things. Like it, I, it's hard to explain, but. I just felt like uh, when I would start going through all of these, go through the motions of all of these, you know, things with my books and stuff like that, it was like, okay, this is what I need to do. This is, this is who, this is what I need to write. I, I mean, I'm like, I, and, and also because I watched so much television and I was like the cliffhangers, you right. know, everything has a cliffhanger. If you read my book, every chapter has a little cliffhanger at the end of it. It's like, okay, right. you know, it's like, oh, we got to see what's going to happen next. And again, that's again being from episodic television. But you know, I mean, but at the same time, but uh, I don't ever think myself as being a screenwriter. Uh, but well, you know, uh, but, but, but yeah. you know, when I was reading about all your books and and letting my mind go, they certainly have a really great potential. And the fact that you're using uh, LGBTQ characters, mm -hmm. what um, I think. One of the first films I've seen, um, what is his name? M. Night Schmoch. I never saw oh, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Knock Schmoch. at the Cabin Door. Yes. Like, I'm like, good for you. You know, absolutely. Absolutely. And, it's kind of tragic what happens in the movie, but you know, it's, but you know what? That, <laughs> I got to tell you, Patrick, that was really a great movie. It, yeah, it was. A I'm, a, I'm a horror fiction and supernatural aficionado. I see all, I really love that movie. And kudos to him. You yes. know, he had, um, you know, same sex couple in mm -hmm. the film mm -hmm. uh, who had adopted a little girl. Right. So yeah. using modern day scenarios in a horror film, people just aren't doing that. I saw a great 
not that I'm a screenwriter, but I see great potential. Well, thank you. I mean, the lot, it's interesting because a lot of my friends who have read it, they said, um, so I'm ready to do the audio book for you. Oh. <laughs> that's so funny. That is, that is. Like, again, yeah. And a lot of my friends are actors. So right. they're, you know, so they're, you know, because I did do, I did try, I tread the boards. I still do occasionally, but I you know, but uh, that's just part of, you know, kind of being able to get out of yourself and be able to be another character. So like, and that's what I do now, instead of being on the stage so much, now I get to like play with characters in terms of creating them. You know, Oh my God, it's great. Right. Yeah. And that is not that far from directing them on stage. So I think that that, I can see that coming down the pike for you in, in the future. I well, really can. It, it really I blends nicely with what you're doing. Now your first book was Prince Patrick. That yeah, that was a memoir that I wrote. Um, I, I started off because I was a I was a very precocious child. That, that's a nice that's a nice euphemism. Precocious. <laughs> Patrick was a handful. Well, you were so damn smart. Well, and that was the thing, you know. Like as a as a kid, I used to be like. You know, I, I never ever was like mean or mischievous. I, it was like I was just curious about things. So, like when I would like you know do things like to to do creatures, like for example, like why would I pull off you know the wings off of you know of bugs? It wasn't about like I was trying to kill them. It's like I wanted to see what they did as a result that, of you know. Right, that yeah. is like a certain kind of kid. <laughs> exactly. So all these stories were talked about me all the time. Every time we would get together for a family event, it just never ever it it, it always came up. Oh, Oh my God, the time that Patrick was in church and the time when the preacher came down and he said out, out loud, said, is that God, you know, or when he heard Holy Ghost that he started talking about Casper. I mean, it was like, you know, I was like that kind of kid. Right. So I, I started writing just these things that, I, that you know, my stories that were from my childhood. Some were very good. Some of them were like, uh, I don't know if I want to have a kid after this. I'm like, I, I'm the dedication actually, the beginning of the book is like, I dedicated to my mother. I said, I can't believe you wanted to have another child after you had Prince Patrick. Like, why would you, why would anybody? Yeah, so, right. That you went for it again. <laughs> <laughs> so I was writing it and then, uh, and then something really tragic happened. My mother was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. I, I did read that. Yeah. yeah. And so I, then it was really important for me to get that finished the memoir, for her right. so that she was able, and she read it while she was getting her chemotherapy. So, you know, that was, that was not the original reason why I started writing it, but look it was how, absolutely. Look at what happened and, yeah. and what an amazing gift that you were able to give to your mother. Yeah. And, and everybody in the family and, and you know, it was self-published. It wasn't something that I, I, I didn't, I didn't the publisher i just wanted to get it done yeah. so that she would have it for her to be able to read and um it was a family effort my niece was the one who put together the the, the book cover i mean she worked for vogue at one time in the city i mean she's a very very talented graphic artist so everybody came together to try and make this so that my mother had this for it so that was that was sort of and i also said um interestingly enough i said I base this a lot on uh, Harper Lee. You know, Harper Lee wrote one book, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird. And I said to myself at the time, I said, if this is the only book that I ever write, ever, then I'm okay with that. This will be my, this will be it. And then, I don't know, if something happened, I was like, I, I had all these stories in my head. And I was like, no, I think I need to write more. And so it was really a fluke. I never saw myself, Wendy, ever doing this as kind of like my post sort of teaching career kind of but thing. I never I saw it. Kind of ask you, you had stories in your head while you were teaching. Were you writing them down or they stayed in your head? They just stayed in my head. And, and it was, yeah. And, 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 um, and, and I will tell you, here's another thing I, I have. I feel like, and I've talked to this about with some of my friends and with my, this, these mediums that I've had, I was like, I, I get these stories that come in dreams and it's not like it's a dream that will take the entire night and whether I get up to whatever you know, use a restroom or get whatever, whatever like that, as soon as I go back to sleep, it continues, it pops right back in. It's almost like something wants me to tell these stories. Um, and so, yeah. Dream continuity because mm -hmm. that I have dreams big time. Um, it's rare that it has dream continuity. If I get it up for any reason, I'll try and hang on to it consciously mm -hmm. and try and get back and grab it again. And it has happened a number of times, but it's not the norm. Usually when you get up, it breaks the dream. Yeah. And 
it's supposed to be the story that you're supposed to be telling. Exactly. And, 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 and you probably also read that when I'm writing a book and I'm writing a chapter, the way that I sort of envision my chapters is that I will take my dogs for a walk. And that is incredibly peaceful. And there's nobody, there's no, there's no stimuli because I'm just walking the dogs. And I literally will start putting together the entire chapter in my head about where it's going with the plot. I know what the end is going to be most of the time, although that's not always true. But I, how do I get there? And so when I finish with the walk, I rush to my computer and I bang out the outline of it. And then I use that to be able to elaborate on it eventually and, and grow it's more. So the interesting to me that you called it walking meditation because yes. meditation is supposed to be in one spot with one focus. You're out with your dogs and you do a walking meditation mm -hmm. and then you run back and you pen it. You know, you write it all down when you get back. That exactly. it, I had made a note to myself as <laughs> process it's really very interesting yeah and i think that and the reason why i bring that up is because i kind of think that when i'm in that sort of meditative state like when i'm just like with the only stimuli that i have is you know what's around me in nature which is you know it's all natural and the dogs are for the most part are really good i don't have to do too much with them I feel like that's sort of connected to the dream thing that I have at night, you know, when I'm sleeping, it's like there's, there is some sort of force that comes into me when I'm without any kind of stimuli around me that could be distracting and, and puts these ideas in my head. I really feel like I'm sort of like, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a transistor, if you will, for something, maybe I'm, I'm the one, I'm the translator of somebody or something is trying to get these stories out. And it's important in terms of like what, one of the, um, one of the mediums, one of the psychics that I've talked to said, and she, I, I asked her, I said, so what do you see for me? She says, Oh, I see you're very much like me. You are here to enlighten. Right. And I was like, wow, I never thought of myself ever being like a person that enlightened things. And I, and I think that's a really grandiose word. Right. And I'm like, I would never ever say like, I am the enlightener. But she said that to me. And I said, you are here to enlighten. I said, you mean through, she's like, through your books, you are here to enlighten people. Story, absolutely. Storytelling is one of the oldest way of enlightening. And the metaphor you hit on, you're like a transistor radio the more we talk, because I, I still, I needed to know where Henry came from. The more we talk, I think Henry was, I know he wasn't in the house. I think Henry was outside, maybe by the glacial lake. Something happened there. And then mm -hmm. when you came into this house with your husband, Henry was drawn in. That's yeah. what I think. It, yeah. it made, you gave Henry a safe place to go. Yeah. And, and, and he is also, like I said, it, it's my, my husband and myself, but we have had several guests here also that have also encountered things from Henry too. So he, he's very much like, he just wants to also, usually when these things have happened to our guests, it's always something that's also sort of like connected to something that's going on in their lives. What happened to them? And they're like, Oh, okay. You know, and, 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 and so I don't want to give away too much of that because that is a major plot point. That's in service. Yeah. one of the things that happens to one of our guests is a we major never plot people point. in any way on this show, show. We don't give it away. We yeah. don't it. But, um, while we're dancing around it, I do have a question. The dogs, yeah. tell me what the dogs say. Animals. Um, yeah, minutes. the dogs when the dogs will all of a sudden will just get up in the middle of the uh, you know middle of the night and start barking at something, or yeah. they will start they'll they'll run out of the room and run downstairs to get to something and and of course you could always say well there might be bears outside or there might be some sort of animal but I mean I, I, there's been a couple of times when it happened with one of the dogs and I was like and it, it was really they were they were quite loud about it and very specific like there was something threatening out there so i turned on the lights outside there was nothing there i went outside and looked around to see if there was a bear or a coyote or whatever there was nothing there but there was clearly something that made her like go bark at that window and, and she can't see anything because it was dark it was at night so there's nothing you can see we live in a, in a neighborhood there's no lights there's no street lights so there's like there's no way she could see anything so it's kind of like a couple of times there's been some things like that and i think sometimes they also you know sometimes <laughs> i'll come downstairs and it looks like they've been playing with somebody all day all night long or something because they're exhausted and i'm like why are you so tired you've slept all night <laughs> Maybe they haven't, you know. Listen, yeah. you know, 
it's a beautiful thing. You've given a home to Henry, which is was great. Henry was lost. Now he's been found. Um, mm-hmm. Now I'm curious. Your your husband obviously supports you in mm-hmm. in your writing. How much is your husband a part of this um, supernatural world? Uh, in the book, uh, the 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 characters of Mitch and Buck are amalgams of both of us. They are amalgams of both of you. So you've created yeah. Mitch and Buck after the two of you. Is your mm-hmm. husband though as into it as you are, or he knows it exists and he supports you? That's my question. Yeah, he he knows it's he knows it exists he knows because it exists. it's like just these things happen, and we can't. There is no logical reason for them to happen, and 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 the and again. I've never heard Henry. Matt is the only one who's ever heard him. So he like, and and that I that probably was the thing that freaked him out the most. Was like, well, you know, he said hello to him. He, did. he said hello to him. <laughs> like just been like it, you know. <laughs> hello, Matt. <laughs> and that makes it, and that makes it into servant as well. That makes it in the book, and that's not, again, that's just like, a, 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 and a culmination of all the things that happened to Mitch and Buck. That, that that the spirit says hello to one of them one time, and they're like trying to figure out who said hello because there's nobody else in the house. That kind of thing. It was, it was the same thing that happened to him. No, he's very supportive of it. And when I told him, I said, I want to write this book, and I want to use the things that have happened in our home as the beginning, the the that sort of set the whole thing. Once the psychic. Gladys gets there and connects with the spirit. Then it's all Patrick. Uh, it's all my imagination at that point. Everything that happens, including the Lenape character, Masingwa Medue. He that is all in my head. But every single thing that happens to Mitch and Buck is based on something that has happened to either us or to our guests. Wow. So he was very supportive of that part. He had no idea about the rest of it. And um it was funny because, again, as a burgeoning writer, I was sort of like, I don't know, even know the process of all this, how this all works, you know. And I was like, and so I was always a little afraid to like have her, be, you know, be my beta readers. And so when the book actually finally came out and uh, it was accepted, um, I gave it to him to read the whole thing, and he was on vacation. And so he <laughs> we do vacations up. He went to Cape Cod, I believe, with a friend of ours. And when he came back, I was very nervous about how, because this is not the kind of genre that he reads. He reads a lot of James Patterson. He likes, you know, John Grisham and things like that. And so when he came back, I think he was like, wow, I, you know, I had no idea that, you know, that you could write like this or this, you know, you did a beautiful job. Yeah. That though, I mean, the two of you together, he had no idea that you had that in you. And you're right. He mm-hmm. you reads John Grisham. And yet he picks up your piece of writing and can say that. Yeah. That- it was that was probably the that was the most important critic. <laughs> if you will. He's the most important critic. And uh, you know, he's he's read everything that I have I've 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 put out. Um uh, I, this new this new manuscript I just sent it to my editor. I'm going to send it to I'm going to give it to him soon so he can read that as well. Um, uh, but Bedfordshire Warlock, he I, I think he's waiting for it to come out in paperback so he can read it again. He's read it once before, and I'm sure he'll be like, you know, after it goes to the copy editing process, and then after the editing process, it's a different book sometimes. You know, it's it's, it's you know not just the grammatical things or the theme. There's a lot that can change. But obviously you're working with an editor who gets who you are and what you're trying. You, you know, you have to. I have this lovely editor from Canada. I love her to death. Uh, yeah, she's, she's fabulous. And so, um, and she, she lets me, uh, she lets me be me, if you will. (laughs) She lets me change anything important. Yeah. It it can only go that way. Now, um, I know you're influenced. You like uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. Um, What other authors like in the area of supernatural rate? Oh, I am a huge Anne Rice aficionado. I was crushed when she passed away last year. And, you know, that if I would say if there's any one book besides Edgar Allan Poe's early stuff like the Telltale Heart and the Raven, uh, the Castle Montiato, all those things that influenced me when I was a kid, and that's what I read. By the way, like again, weird kid over here reading Edgar Allan Poe and everybody else is reading, you know, like you know, like. <laughs> but um, Anne Rice's Interview with the Vampire, I was. Oh. 
Yeah. That to me was kind of like the book that really got me to like, that is the, uh, that, that's where that's, that is the ultimate for me. Right. She is the ultimate. Everybody else is going to be compared to her. Everybody. Um, right. and, uh, she did not disappoint whether it was in the interview with the, with the, the vampire chronicles or the May four witches. Yes. I was always so fascinated. Even when she did her like sort of offshoot things, you know, the one with the werewolf for a while, I, I, I loved everything that she did. Right. Um, another, another gentleman that I really enjoy. Um, and he doesn't get anywhere near the kind of notoriety of his father is a, is a writer named Joe Hill who is the son of Stephen King. He is absolutely fascinating. Where Stephen King is very, like, I, I like Stephen King. Joe Hill will, and will, he'll take something and he will tear it apart and he will, like, remodel it into something that you're like, wow, I didn't see that coming. I and that to me is very exciting. That's what I like to do. In my writing, I try to take something, again, like the old tropes, and invert it and put a new thing into it. And you're like, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming. That kind of thing. I, I love you, that. I can't wait to read this book. Now, okay. um, I got my five-minute warning because I could be on here for another hour with you. <laughs> I could too. <laughs> Just real quick, uh, going into historical houses, you know, I'm looking on the weekends, the columns in Milford is mm -hmm. terribly haunted. I went to start my car there one night, and I have been warned that the Josephine likes to play tricks with people. My key fob did not work, and my oh, car no. was dead. And <laughs> so they told me that came out, and they said to me, hold on a sec, and said, Josephine, let Wendy into her car, okay, and let her car work, please. And I went, and I turned the car on, and it kicked over. It was wow. a brand until there was no reason for it not to work. But I have been warned by this person from the columns that that kind of thing could happen. And people have seen Josephine in the window. Do you, when you go into these buildings, do you feel things? Can you really feel it? I do. And I, it's not like, it, I, I don't see things necessarily, but I do feel them. And you know one what? thing that, um, that happened to me when I was a kid um, and, and again, I'm going to give too much away because actually is, is creepy no, no, no. another book, <laughs> but I, I went into a historical house in Maine and I was able to, I'd never seen something before and I knew exactly what it was used for. And it was something that does not, it's not used in modern technology. It is a, a child who was like 10 or 11 years old would have no idea what it was. I knew, uh, and the docent was talking about it. And I and someone and she made a question and I answered it and I said I know exactly what that's for and I know how you do it and I know where it goes and all this sort of stuff and she was just like, wow, uh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think of that more as a connection to a past life. That was something that was a reverberation. I knew that. I don't know if that had anything to do with my passing or why that was such an important thing for me to know, but it was clearly was. something that I knew very easily. It was something I didn't have to think about. It just came like, like that. Yeah. So we're like down to the wire here. Where can, first of all, people um, hear you speak? Where are you doing book signings? Please share that. I actually with have a tour coming up. Um, and, and if you go to patrickfieldauthor.com, it's all one okay. word, patrickfieldauthor. Um, I'm going to be posting uh, for this next book for Wed Bedfordshire Warlock. I'm going to be doing a whole list, a whole like month of signings in June for Pride. <laughs> and oh, it's going to be. Yeah, it's going to be mostly in the, the Northeast Pennsylvania area. I have, I've made a couple of, uh, I've tried to get some uh, some places in Cape Cod because this one takes place in a Salem like Massachusetts. Area. Oh my God, that's great! Right? Yeah, yeah right. It's, so I want to I want to be able to have uh, some signings there. We'll see how that works out. But I'm clearly going to be doing them here. I will be selling Serpent as well, and I you know, um, but I'll be mostly pushing Bedfordshire. But um, yeah, that's what I'm planning on doing in June. And then, of course, I've got some, you know, some of these book clubs coming up. So I'm very excited about talking about that. There it is, PatrickPhilArthur.com. And Perfect. there you are. We got you up on the big screen. Uh, you got to <laughs> let me know when you're coming to Milford. 
I so am. I'm going to, I'm going, I will be posting all that. I'm still trying to like, I'm still trying to like, you know, iron out some details and things like that, but I'm absolutely going to be making Milford. Great. I'm very excited for you, Patrick. I love, I totally love what you're doing. I want to thank you for being on the show. I always wrap it up with a big, happy smile. Cheese. <laughs> One more. Great. Thank you. I wish you luck. Um, hopefully by the next time I see you, I will have read Servant at least. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> okay. I hope so too. Um, and, I, and I'd be loved. I would love to hear what you have to say. I, 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 and I'm one of those authors that's not afraid to hear when people give me negative or or positive. I, 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 I learn. I learn from. You, you know, know what? You already sucked me in on it. I just it's everything that I'm like interested in. So of course I'm gonna I'm gonna love the book. You know, okay. I'm very very excited to to read it. And I know our book club at Triversity is too. Thank you so much. And I will uh, see you around, as they say. Our paths will cross. And Absolutely. thank you for doing the show tonight. Wishing you the oh, best. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And it was a lovely time. You have a good thank night. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Bye bye. Bye.